Um, so, guys, I'm going to start you off on a journey through Malaysia. So I'm going to start you from the south of Malaysia, basically straight through to the borders of Thailand, um, and give you a bit of a feel for what the, the expat um, communities, where the expat communities live um, in Malaysia, um, and what those towns are actually about, and why the expats live in those particular towns. Um, while I'm doing that, we, we've got a question set, uh, we've got a Q&A session tomorrow. Um, Kirsten and I are actually doing a Southeast Asian presentation tomorrow afternoon. So if you have questions, either save them for after this um, or during the break, um, or save them until tomorrow afternoon when we can kind of both jump in and help and, and answer them for you. So before I start on this, um, I've been asked about my history with Malaysia. Um, I grew up in Malaysia as a kid, so I spent time in KL uh, with my parents. Um, I went to school in Malaysia. Um, and then after that, my parents moved to Brunei and then to Singapore. So as a kid, I got to know Southeast Asia really, really well. And then as an adult, my wife and I moved to um, Hong Kong, and we were traveling throughout Southeast Asia all the time. So again, we got to know Southeast Asia as adults um, as well. So consequently, we've done a lot of traveling throughout Southeast Asia. And this is now coming into our sixth year um, in Penang. So we've been here almost six years now. Um, and again, we've seen Penang change um, exponentially during that time, all for the better. Um, and actually, Malaysia has changed um, greatly um, for the better during that time. And as we go through the slides, you'll, you'll see um, as I start to talk about it. So without much ado, Malaysia. So the light blue on the screen is Peninsula Malaysia, um, which is where we are now. And you'll see that Penang is up in the, the northwest corridor. Uh, the yellow um, is the borders of Thailand, southern borders of Thailand, where you guys have just come from. And the dark blue down the bottom is Singapore. The reason it's important to mention that is because southern Thailand and Singapore actually used to be part of Malaysia. And it's only in the last hundred years that southern Thailand was given back um, to, to Thailand. Um, and Singapore was actually excluded from Malaysia in about 1965. So all of that used to be part of the Malaysian Peninsula. Um, and it's, there's a lot of similarities um, between southern Thailand and down in Singapore. The makeup of the people is very much the same, Indian, um, Chinese, Malay, and of course us, you know, the European mix. Um, over on the left is uh, Borneo, and you'll see that Malaysia is also part of Borneo. So Sabah and Sarawak, which are two states, are also part of Borneo, and we'll be covering that in this presentation as well. Um, Brunei is in there, so the little country of Brunei is up the top, and of course down below you have Indonesia. And this map here is actually an interesting one because it shows you the close proximity of Indonesia to Malaysia. Um, and again, a lot of similarities. And if you go back in time, most of the Malay people actually came from Indonesia. So it actually gives you a, a really good kind of view of, of where we are and where Malaysia is. So we're going to start you off in South Malaysia. So in Malacca, and we're going to take you further, um, bring you all the way up into Penang and then take you over into, um, into Borneo. So Malacca is the earliest inhabited colonial city um, in Malaysia. Uh, and it was inhabited by the Portuguese probably in around the 1500s. Um, the Portuguese were very quickly kicked out by the Dutch, and the Dutch were very quickly kicked out by the English. Um, so Malacca has a great history to it, which is why it's also a UNESCO-listed um, heritage city, very much like Penang. In fact, they were both given UNESCO status in 2008. So it's architecturally a very, very um, pretty city to walk around. Um, it's a sea city. It sits on the Straits of Malacca, and it's also a river city. So it's a very interesting place. The expats who um, move down to Malacca or who live in Malacca are predominantly the golfing community. So a lot of expats who play golf move down there because there's a lot of golf courses that surround Malacca. Um, and it's very easy to actually rent housing on golf courses down there. So if you, just as a for instance, if you took a house on a golf course down in Malacca, you could get a 4,000 square foot house down there for about 700 US a month. And that's right on the golf course itself. Golf fees run at about $35 a game. So I don't, I don't play golf, so I don't know whether that's expensive or not, but it sounds pretty reasonable, especially when you can actually live on a, live on a golf course. Um, the, great thing, the other great thing about Malacca's position is that it's very close to Singapore and very close to KL, Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. So the expats who live there also tend to go into Singapore at weekends because you can just drive there. Uh, there's a causeway that links Singapore, or you can drive up to KL. So although Malacca is very quiet and it's very laid back, you can actually get your big city fixed pretty quickly just by either going two hours south or two hours north. And it's one of the big draw cards um, of living in that particular town. 
Um, obviously, golf, I've mentioned to you, is quite big there. Malacca, over the last couple of years, has also become a bit of a cafe society. Um, a lot of cafes have sprung up in the last three years. But it's very different to KL, Ipo, or Penang, in so much that they're localized cafes. There's, there's no Western cafes there, really, whatsoever. The other downside to that is that everything closes down by about 7 o'clock at night. So if you're looking to go to a cafe to get something to eat, or you're looking for a restaurant to get something to eat, there's nowhere there to do it. What you do have there, though, is a, a plethora of three and four star hotels, um, because industry just outside Malacca is quite, um, quite vibrant. So the hotels cater for that. And the expats who live there tend to go to the bars in the hotels, or they go to the restaurants in the hotels. So that's what they do. The other big thing that the expats do there is that they, they tend to con congregate in each other's houses on a regular basis. So there's dinner parties that are thrown every week just to keep everybody you know, pretty much in the loop. That's a really nice thing about Malacca, but it's, you, you have to be aware that that's the downside if you were going to go down and live there. It's a very quiet place to be. <clears throat> so going two hours north, you get to Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. So Kuala Lumpur, like any major city, it's a vibrant, happening city. And one of the things that I always notice when I go down there is that it tends to be a trendy city. Penang's a little bit laid back. I mean, you'll see today that the presenters were all wearing kind of long pants and, and shirts. We don't usually wear that. It's more a t-shirt and shorts uh, place, Penang. It's a, it's a bit more relaxed. But KL's a little, more, a little bit more dressy. Um, and the shopping centers, you'll really notice it when you go in there that people dress up to, to go there. Um, it's the capital of Malaysia, so therefore it has heaps and heaps of cafes, amazingly good restaurants. And there are five-star Michelin chefs now running restaurants in KL that are just outstanding, literally on a world-class level. So um, as well as amazing street food, you, you have the, the other end of the spectrum where you can actually go to really, really good five-star five restaurants if you want. And keep in mind, too, that the five-star restaurants in KL aren't going to cost you what five-star restaurants cost you back home. Um, they're a lot cheaper than that. And that's also a, a big plus for living in KL or living in Malaysia. Housing in KL can be as expensive or as cheap as you want it to be. Um, KL, KLCC, or the center of KL, um, I know people who rent apartments there, 2,000 square foot apartments, and they're paying roughly six to $800 a month. So they're right in the center of KL. But I also know people there who are paying $5,000 a month. So it really depends on what kind of apartment you want and what amenities you want with it. But keep in mind, as, you, as we travel you know, across Malaysia, most of the apartments um, and houses, or most of the apartments actually in Malaysia, have all of them have gyms, swimming pools, 24-hour security, um, and carports. And that's pretty much across the board. It's, it's standard when you rent an apartment here. So something just to keep in mind. Shopping in KL is fantastic. Um, we actually, in Penang, travel down to KL to do shopping sometimes because they have shops there that we don't have here. Um, a prime example of that is Ikea. Um, and I know you guys probably have Ikea you know, kind of all the way across. We actually don't, and it's one of the shops that we covet. But Ikea is coming here um, just across on the, on the mainland in a couple of years' time. They've already started building a superstore over there. But it's, it's another excuse to go down to KL and basically have a big city fix. It's, it's a fun place to go to. I've mentioned LA down the bottom, and um, it's not like I think, when I think of KL, I go, oh, yeah, it's just like LA. The reason I mention that is because um, KL, to me, is set out very much like LA. So although you have a center, which is KL, which is a central shopping dist district, you have a lot of outlying districts where the expat communities tend to live, primarily because they don't want to live inside a big city. So they live outside um, in these very, very nice areas. And it's very much like LA to that extent, that you have a center of LA, and then you have all the outlying suburbs, and people drive a lot to get to where they want to go. KL is exactly the same as that. So the expats there don't mind the driving, and they pretty much drive into KL when they need to. That being said, all of these outlying areas in KL have their own shopping centers, they have their own you know, you know, movie complexes, they have their own restaurants. So they don't necessarily have to do that, but if you want to get into KL, that's what they do. I mentioned clubs here, and when I put that on there, I thought people might be talking about, you know, kind of club clubs. Um, I'm not of that age where I talk about clubbing. When I talk about clubs, it's a very Malaysian thing. Um, when the British came here, and I'll talk about this a little bit later on, um, they started um, their own clubs because it was a way to mix with their own kind, to, to get away from the, the Malays, the Chinese, the Indians, and to be with their own kind. 
So the clubbing culture in Malaysia has been prominent for literally 150 years. The British set up the clubs and it used to be the clubs that they go to. Now what we have is a great club and associations culture. And I'll talk to you a little bit about that later on. But KL actually has some really nice clubs and I'll, I'll mention that as we go through. So going two hours further north, and this is really interesting. I did this the other day, and I was kind of working it out. You can literally drive the length and breadth of Malaysia, or the, the length of Malaysia, in eight hours. And Malaysia seems to be split up into two-hour intervals. So from Singapore to Malacca, it's two hours. Malacca to KL, it's two hours. KL to Ipoh, it's two hours. And Ipoh to Penang is two hours. Penang to the Thai border, two hours. And I'm pretty sure it hasn't been set out that way, but it's just the way it kind of works, and I just thought it was really interesting. So two hours north of KL, you have the, the mining town, the old mining town of Ipoh. And as I run through the history presentation a little bit later on, um, Ipoh was a great mining town. Malaysia made uh, more millionaires through tin mining and rubber um, in the 1860s and 1890s than any other country on Earth. So this is a really old tin mining town. Um, there's some amazing architecture there. But the great thing about this is that after the, the tin mines closed down, the, the guys who owned the tin mines then started beautifying the towns. So it's actually a really cute little town. The Cafe Society kicked off there about three years ago. And there are some amazing cafes and boutique restaurants down there, um, which have all opened in the last three years. So it's a really nice place to go to for, for weekends. Uh, there's also a great Sunday market, which we don't have here in Penang. And of course, you, it's only a two hour drive, so it's a very easy thing to, um, to drive down there too. So Ipoh has become a, it's an, it's an up and coming town where expats have tended to gravitate to who want the quieter life. So yes, you have great restaurants, yes, you have the boutique hotels, and it stays open later at night. So a, um, a livelier place to be than, than Malacca, for instance. Um, so a lot going on there. The other great thing about Ipoh is it's very near the Cameron Highlands, and it's very near a town called Taiping. The Cameron Highlands were one of six hill stations that the British built when they came here you know, back in the 1800s. Um, and hill stations were really where the colonials used to, used, to, used to go because the weather was a little bit cooler um, during the, the, the summer season here. And they built the most amazing bungalows um, on these hill stations. So they would go up there and they would relax. It would be a little bit cooler. But primarily they went there to escape the heat and the Malaysian people because they could be by themselves. They could actually be what they wanted to be. They could laugh. And they didn't do a lot of that when they were ruling Malaysia. It was a very, very stern rule that the British had. So they escaped to these kind of places to really have a bit of fun. So the Cameron Highlands are really, really interesting. Um, as you drive up to the Cameron Highlands, there's tea plantations um, and you can visit the tea plantations, which is nice. Um, there's a golf course up there as well, so you can actually play golf. And there's an amazing amount of walks up there. Um, I mentioned a book there called Garden of the Evening Mist. This was a book that came out um, a couple of years ago. If you, if you haven't read it um, and you're interested in a, a fictional historical story about the Cameron Highlands, it's a fantastic book to read. Very, very good book. And it was set in the 1930s, 1940s during the, uh, the Japanese invasion. Um, the other cool thing about the Cameron Highlands is it's where Jim Thompson disappeared. Um, I don't know whether you guys know Jim Thompson. You guys all heard of Jim Thompson? Okay, so Jim Thompson, interesting guy. He was a founding member of the OSS, which was a precursor for the CIA. He arrived in Bangkok in the late 1950s, a very, very wealthy man, um, and started to revitalize the Thai silk industry. So Jim used to holiday in the Cameron Highlands, and in 1969, he disappeared off the face of the earth, never to be seen again. And part of the Cameron Highlands mystery is trying to find out where Jim Thompson disappeared to. And you can actually still stay in his cottage there. You know, the, you can rent it, you can stay in the same room that Jim um, disappeared from. And it was an interesting time because uh, Jim was there in 1969. You know, if you think about what was going on in Asia at that particular time, you know, the Vietnam War, you had problems in Indonesia, uh, the Philippines were erupting. You had all this stuff going on, um, and Jill, Jim was very politically involved. So it's kind of not surprising that he disappeared when he disappeared. But still, it's a, it's a mystery, and it's one of the intriguing things. Taiping um, is an hour north um, of um, um, Ipoh, and it's also another mining town. The really nice thing about Taiping is that the, the quarry where the tin used to be mined has since been filled in, and it's the most beautiful lake, and there are the most stunning gardens that surround it. So again, a very pretty place to go. There's, a, there's an amazing war cemetery there, a very moving Second World War cemetery there, um, and, it's, uh, and there's also a zoo there. So lots to do in and around this particular area. 
Housing is also cheaper down there uh, because you're in EPO. So it's, it's way cheaper, probably about a third cheaper than what you pay um, here in Penang. Rents are all, also cheaper down there. Um, but you have to keep in mind that you're two hours from Penang. And if you want the quieter lifestyle where you can go for walks and you can play golf, it's the ideal place to go. But it's a little bit more subdued and a little bit quiet. Normally, here, we would go to Penang because we're going two hours further north, but we've got the Penang presentation after this, so I'm going to leave that out. And I'm going to take you to Kota Kinabalu. Kota Kinabalu is over on the island of Borneo, and it's the, the capital of Sabah. Um, if I wasn't living in Penang, I think I'd be living there um, because it really is quite an astoundingly beautiful place. And again, over the last couple of years, Kota Kinabalu has become quite the cafe, kind of boutique hotel, hotel society as well. There are a plethora of five-stroke six-star six star hotels um, up and down the coastline. It's a real holiday maker's paradise, um, and it's a very beautiful place to be. Scuba diving there is, is massive. Um, I don't know whether we have any scuba divers here, but scuba diving is, um, is one of the big things. Um, and this picture up the top is from the Tunku Abdul Rahman Marine Park. I know that sounds like a bit of a mouthful. Um, but Tunku Abdul Rahman was actually the first Prime Minister of Malaysia, so it's actually named after him in his honour. Um, but quite an astoundingly beautiful park. The, you also have the Kota Kinabalu National Park there, which has more wildlife, more bird wildlife than any other park on Earth. So it's a very, very special place to be. And of course you have Mount Kinabalu, um, which is one of, the, one of the tallest mountains in Southeast Asia. And just as an anecdote, um, we, one of the first times we went to um, Kota Kinabalu, we'd been scuba diving, my wife and I. And <clears throat> after the scuba diving trip, Lisa said to me, you know, we should climb Mount Kinabalu. She said, this, this book says it's a walk in the park. And I said, really? I said, it's a 12,000 foot mountain. <laughs> and she said, no, no, no. She said, it's a walk in the park. I'm like, okay. I said, we'll do it then. So we booked a guide the following morning and off we went. And um, oh my God, it was the worst thing we could have ever done. We hadn't trained for it. Um, and suddenly, we were climbing this mountain. So we, and the only advice they gave us, they said, bring a lot of chocolate and some water. And we're like, that sounds like a fun thing to do, so we'll do that. So the, the, I mean, there's a story about this, but the, the funny thing is you, we got to our rest station, and there's a, there's a big rest house up there where you have to rest. You get there at about 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, <clears throat> and you have to rest until 2 a.m. in the morning. And at 2 a.m. in the morning, in the pitch black, you can't climb the rest of the mountain in the hope of getting to the summit um, in, with the sun rising, you know, so it's all very symbolic. So they gave us our room, <clears throat> and it's a, it's a shared room with bunk beds. And, you know, I hadn't slept in a bunk bed since I was like five, I think, so that was an experience by itself. But we got into the room, and in the room were this Greek goddess couple from Australia. Both of them six foot tall, both of them blonde, you know, stunningly fit and just amazing looking. And we, you know, we got in there and we, really, really nice couple. Anyway, it got time to, to go to bed. So they turned around and said, well, you know, if you guys want to get changed, we'll get changed after you. And, you know, we looked at each other and went, nah, you guys go first. No, it's okay. So they very quickly stripped down to their underwear and got into bed. And it was like watching something out of muscle and fitness. You know, we, <laughs> we sat there looking at these guys and we're like, Oh, my God. Anyway, they got into bed, and they said, okay, you guys get changed. And we were like, no, 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 we're okay, thanks. We'll just um, we'll get into bed fully clothed. We've only got a couple of hours to go. It's going to be absolutely fine. So just one of the stories about Mount Kinabalu. But it's, um, it is an amazing thing to climb, and we, we actually got to the summit. Um, and so it is something to, to say that you've done. Other great things about um, Kota Kinabalu, you're very near to the island of Sipadan. Um, Sipadan, if you're a diver, has been in the top 10 dive sites for the last 20 years. It's still a very spectacular place to go to, um, and you can get there from Kota Kinabalu very quickly. Sandakan is also uh, very nearby. Um, it's a, Sandakan is the old British North Borneo capital, so it's a, it's a very colonialist town. Um, and of course, during the Second World War, it was the, uh, the scene of the, the death march, the Sandakan death march. Um, and there's a, there's a woman there now, an American woman there now, actually, who leads um, war tours around that particular area. And it's, it's very, very good. So if you ever do go, go. I've mentioned um, Agnes Keith down the bottom because no one really seems to know who she is, and I think you should. Agnes Keith is an American woman who went to um, Sandakan in the 1920s. She married a British planter. And she, all alone, left New York City and went to Sandakan to live with her, her then British husband. Um, what she did was she created the most beautiful house there, and it's on a buff overlooking Sandakan Bay. 
stunningly, stunningly beautiful. And the, uh, the government over there, I mean, she, she you know, died a long time ago, but the government over there actually transformed the house. They um, reinvented it, put all the original furniture back in. It's now a museum. Um, it's definitely worthwhile going to if you go there. And there's now a really nice cafe right next to it, which also looks um, over Sandakan Bay. So it's quite something. She also wrote three books on her journey over there. Um, one when she first arrived, the second one during the, um, the invasion of the Japanese and what happened to her and her family, and then afterwards when they went back. So if you, if you feel inclined, um, she's a very good, um, very good authors, authoress. The other cool thing about um, over there, over in um, Kota Kinabalu, is you're in Borneo. So the great thing about that is that you can travel through to Indonesia very easily, Indonesian Borneo very easily, and that's where all the headhunting tribes are, or ex-headhunting tribes are. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's an amazing experience. It's stuff that you will never experience anywhere else in the world. You know, Borneo really is quite an amazing island. Um, and of course, over there now, you also have a number of orangutan sanctuaries. Um, and we, we actually have one here, not very far away from here. It's only two hours drive from Penang. Um, but they're very, very good sanctuaries over there if you're interested in seeing orangutans um, in the wild. So quite a, um, quite a fun place to, um, to go to. Kuching, which is in the state of Sarawak, um, I just want to mention this briefly um, because there isn't a great amount to do in Kuching. Kuching is an amazing capital, though. It's the capital of Sarawak, um, and it was taken over by a British family um, in the 1840s, 1850s, uh, called the Brook family. And uh, Robert Brooke went there and very quickly announced himself as king of Sarawak. And he and his dynasty decided to rule it for the next 150 years. Um, but it's an amazing place. And the reason why I want to mention it now is because, uh, on Kuching actually means cat. That's why there's this really weird cat sculpture in the middle of town. It's kind of weird. You know, you drive along and there's these 19-foot cats everywhere. Um, but Kuching has become a bit of a cafe society, so there's lots and lots of cafes that have just started up, which makes it kind of exciting. There's restaurants there, and there's five-star hotels there. But why you should put it on your watch list is because the restaurant that you guys are going to tonight, China House, is owned by an Australian woman, Norel. And whatever Norel tends to touch in Malaysia turns to absolute gold. Um, she's a, an amazing entrepreneur. She's been in Malaysia about 30 years, done extremely well for herself. And she's now opening a cafe in Kuching. That tells me that Kuching is about to change. Um, and it's something that you should be watching because she does know what she's doing. So, and it's, it's actually a very pretty town to go to. The expat community there is very small. Uh, and one thing I should, should just say about um, Kota Kinabalu, the expat community that live there tend to be golfers and divers. And they don't live in, in KK itself. They actually live outside. Um, and if you, if you ever Google KK or look up KK, there's a lot of communities that live outside, 100, 150 miles outside KK, because that's where the most amazing golf courses are. Um, and they become very, very close-knit communities. So just a, it's a very interesting place. And as I said, Kuching is really about to, um, about to change. <clears throat> Associations and groups in Malaysia, there's lots of them. <laughs> and there's, there's lots in Penang, there's lots in KL, they're, they're in Ipoh as well. But, and these are just some of the ones that I wanted to mention to you. Um, I'll talk about the International Women's Association and the Penang um, one. One I wanted to mention to you here is the Soroptimus. Most people haven't heard of the Soroptimus. It's a women's organization for the betterment of women. Um, and it's a worldwide organization, and they're a very, very good organization. To give you an example of the Soroptimus, um, Lisa was approached by, my wife Lisa was approached by uh, an Indian family not that long ago whose daughter had been accepted at university. But the deal with university was that <clears throat> they had to pay the fees up front and then the university was going to reimburse them um, a little bit later on. And they didn't have the money to pay for those particular fees. <clears throat> so they approached us and we could have actually paid the fees for them. But it seemed like a stopgap and I felt a little bit comfortable about doing that. So Lisa came up with the idea of approaching the Soroptimus because the, they're all about the betterment of women and supporting women. Um, so Lisa met with a family um, and, and, and a girl in question. Within two days, we'd met with the Soroptimus. Um, and within three days, they decided to sponsor her, not only to pay her fees up front, but actually to sponsor her entirely, entire way through university. So it's a really, really good organization. And they raise, they raise a lot of money and do some very, very good things. Um, I'll talk about the American Association now, because most of you are North Americans. Um, 
That's a really active association um, in KL, and they're very closely aligned with the US Embassy down there. They also do some really, really good things in Malaysia. So whenever there's a, a visiting American warship or a visiting American battleship, um, they send out emails to the entire European community to adopt a sailor for a meal. So, so that the sailors can actually get off the ships and they can spend, have dinner with the family or have lunch with the family or spend a day at, at someone's house. And it's a really, really um, valuable thing because it, it not only, it's not only good for the sailor, it actually shows the sailor what living in Malaysia is actually like in predominantly a Muslim country. So it's actually a, a really good thing that they do. The other thing that the American Association does is they, they have a number of funds um, that they, they foster throughout the year. Um, and as an example of that, I was approached a couple of years about a historic project by the American Embassy. Um, so they give out money on a yearly basis for projects that are based in Malaysia. So they're very, very supportive of Malaysia and its, and its economy. So just to give you an idea of, of some of them, you know, I, I mentioned jokingly that, you know, we joined the Irish Association because the Irish drink a lot. You know, being Australian, we actually don't need an excuse to drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, a, um, it was a very good organization to join um, because they do different things. Um, you know, they, there's a golf day once a month. There's a, a trivia night once a, once a month. Um, they also raise a lot of money for charity. And there's a, the Irish ball, which takes place um, on St. Patrick's Day. is one of the biggest balls of the year, um, which is attended by over 1,000 people. So again, it's, it's just a very different association. And you'll meet different people through these associations. Um, and the great thing is you don't have to be Irish. Well, not that being Irish is a bad thing, wherever needed, but you know what I mean. It's a, you, know, you don't have to be. So, it's, um, so the various associations. And these groups were all set up based on the club system that the British set up. So the, the earliest club in Malaysia was set up in about the 1860s, um, actually here in Penang. It's called the Penang Club. Um, and it, as I said, it was a way for the British to escape, from, from them to, to join their own clubs. Interestingly enough, women were only admitted into these clubs um, as early as the 1950s. So they were kind of excluded for a very long time. Um, and this one's really funny because this building here is called the Snake Pit. And when the Penang Swimming Club was built um, in 1903, um, they built that for the women. So the women were only allowed to go into that. They weren't allowed to go into the main part of the club and the men named it the Snake Pit. How awful was that? So anyway, it's still there and actually serves very nice Japanese food. So, um, <laughs> So that's one club. The Penang Sports Club um, is another club here in Penang. Again, a very old club. Um, it's predominantly a tennis club. So um, they have more grass tennis courts here than any other club um, in Malaysia, which is one of the, uh, one of the deciding factors. And we, we actually joined this club because we wanted to play tennis. The surprising thing about joining this particular club um, was that it was so, so social. And we met more people through joining that than we, have in, than we did in the Penang Swimming Club. So it was actually a really good club to join. The other reason we joined um, was um, everything is subsidized. And when I show the, um, the Penang slide, um, I'll show you a bill that we actually had the other day that will probably shock you. Um, but again, the club scene. This is the, uh, the Royal Selangor Club in Kuala Lumpur, um, just to, to keep on that club theme, um, which has the nickname, just so you know, as the Spotted Dog. And there's a great story to that too. So the club scene throughout Malaysia um, is very prevalent. Um, and most people join them, um, join these kind of clubs to meet groups of people that you wouldn't ordinarily meet. So just to go back onto the Penang Swimming Club, for instance, that's a, a club with a 7,000 strong membership, predominantly local. So if you want to meet local people and have local friends, it's a really good club to join. And that's one of the reasons why we joined. You know, we talked about golf kind of intermittently, and um, you know, I've said that you can drive the length and breadth of Malaysia in eight hours. In that eight hours, there's over 200 golf courses. That's a lot of golf courses in a, in a very short space of time. So you know, the golf community here is very, very large. Um, you know, my wife looked at this yesterday and went, oh my god, you know, why have you put a picture of Tom Jones up there? Well, I put it up there to emphasize the entertainment industry in, in, in Malaysia. So, um, you can see down the bottom, these were just acts that are visiting here in, in 2016. So Malaysia really is, it's, a, it's an international place with international acts. And, you know, Tom Jones, Diana Kroll, Elvis Costello, Death Camp for Cutie, these are all acts that are coming here in 2016. So the picture that I'm trying to paint with all of this, you know, when you take in the museums, the Philharmonic orchestras, which both KL um, and Penang has, um, you know, the ballets, the plays, the concerts, uh, the international sporting events, you know, the Grand Prix, Malaysian Grand Prix, which is a Formula One Grand Prix, 
Um, we have the WTA tennis uh, tournament that takes place here. And of course, the number one female squash player in the world is a Malaysian girl. You know, with all of this, there's a lot going on in this particular country all the time. And the great thing about no matter where you live, be Malacca or Penang, it's all very close to you. So, the, you know, it's a very vibrant and um, active community. Festivals. Um, there are over, you know, <laughs> you guys arrived last night <laughs> and uh, you arrived on the, on the, on the end of Taipusam, <clears throat> which is a Hindu festival. So, uh, Taipusam in, in Penang and KL attracts over a million people on that one particular day. Okay, so when you guys arrived, what you were seeing, sadly, was the, was the tail end of what really is the most amazing festival. And I'm sorry that you had such a rough ride in, but it's, it's one of the biggest festivals of the year. You know, you, you never really travel in Malaysia during Taipusam, and you never ever travel during Chinese New Year, um, because there's a mass exodus and people coming in. It's, uh, it's, it's a big, big celebration. But there's over 300 festivals, 300 main festivals that take place in Malaysia throughout the year. Um, and I actually wrote a book about this uh, last year, Festivals of Malaysia, um, that, that came out. But it gives you an indication, again, of, of, the, of the multinational um, country that Malaysia is. And it's not just um, Hindu, Muslim, um, and Chinese festivals. Um, European festivals are massive here. You know, again, I'll talk about it in the Malaysian presentation, but Christmas here is one of the biggest celebrations ever. All the shopping centers have massive Christmas trees. They all put on massive decorations. Um, Gurney Plaza, which is one of the five-star kind of shopping centers here, actually flew in a choir group from Australia, you know, this Christmas, who sang all the way through December. So, you know, there's all sorts of things like that that, that kind of make Malaysia a very colorful, interesting place to be. Um, amazing food. Um, I'm biased, I guess, because I live in Malaysia, but I actually think Malaysia has some of the best food in Southeast Asia. I know you guys have just come from Thailand and you're about to experience um, Malaysian food, but I, I think it really is the best. And it's the best not only because of the fusions of you know, Malay, um, Indian, and Chinese, but also European. And Malacca, for instance, has a group of people called Nonya Babas. Um, in Penang, they're called Baba Nonyas, so the, the reverse of what they're called down there. But that's basically a group that's married into another group. So you might have Malays who are married to Hindus, Malays who are married to Hindus, or Hindus married to Chinese, um, etc. And their food is quite exceptional. And you guys are going to experience that on Wednesday night. So the restaurant that you go to on Wednesday night is a Baba Nonya restaurant. So it's, it, and I think you'll be impressed by it. Islands and beaches, we have 878 of them <laughs> in Malaysian waters. Um, and some quite famous ones. So the most famous one uh, from here is Langkawi, which is only a 40-minute plane ride or a two-hour ferry ride away. Um, but we also have the, the islands of Sipadan um, over in Borneo that I told you about. There's a great island over there called Liang Liang, which is a diving island. Um, and of course, then you have the Perenthians, and it goes on and on and on. Malaysia has lots of amazing islands, and I know you've just seen some. Medical Center of Excellence. Um, Dr. Solomons is here, and he's going to speak a little bit later on about this, so I'm not going to uh, talk about this. But just to say that Malaysia is a medical center of excellence, and we're the, the third highest ranked in Asia at this moment in time, um, behind Singapore and behind Hong Kong. The Malaysian government came out last week, and, and they said that their aim is to be number one by 2020, and I actually believe they'll do it. So something to keep an eye on, and Dr. Solomons will talk to you a little bit about that. Over one million medical tourists came here in, 19, in 2015. You know, that was up by 300,000 people from 2014. That's a million people here just coming for medical, basic medical procedures, dental and um, elective. Um, one third to a quarter of what you pay in the US, actually it's more for you guys now because the dollar is so strong. You know, I think the, you get $4.30 $4 Malaysian now to one US. You know, that's amazing. That translates as if you were paying $900 for an apartment um, two years ago, that apartment now is costing you $700 a month. That's really good value. And it looks like the Malaysian ringgit will continue to weaken, weaken for a while, and the US dollar will get stronger. Um, we talked about the outdoor lifestyle, and I won't talk about that too much, but pretty much golf, tennis, sailing, um, jungle walking is big here. Horse riding is also big in Penang and KL, and bird watching is massive here. I never, I never really kind of clued into bird watchers. I, kind of, I used to think that they were a little bit weird. But I actually went walking with a guy who, um, who watches birds uh, a couple of weeks ago. 
And I was astounded. You know, he was actually pointing out birds that I could, that I could hear but not see. But the really cool thing was, and there's, oh, you'll see this today, up on Penang Hill there's an owl museum, which is a really bizarre thing. Um, don't go in it, whatever you do. But, but I said to this guy, I said, are there owls in Penang? Because I've been walking these jungles for six years. I've never seen an owl. And in the space of an hour, he pointed out five. I just couldn't see them. But as a bird watcher, you actually can. They know what to look for. So quite, quite amazing. OK, last but not least, direct access to Asia. So this is all about um, Penang is a, or, or Malaysia is very central to Southeast Asia. And one of the reasons why we all move here is because we have direct, act, uh, direct access to all of these amazing countries. Um, you know, it, within Asia itself, we're literally within one to four hours flying of some of these amazing countries. And I've included Australia in this because although we, we don't like to think so, Australia is actually in Asia. You know, we're, we're, in, we're in that group. Um, and we go back, I don't go back as often as I should. You know, my wife goes back to Australia at least once, sometimes twice a year. Um, and it's a very easy trip to do. And that is one of the attractions. So ladies and gentlemen, that's it on the, the Asian presentation. So thank you very much. Um, we now have the Penang presentation coming up, so don't go away. <laughs>